So, um, are you gonna, great, there we go. Now we are recording. And um, please, even when we are gonna have Emilio and uh, TR and Tobias, um, uh, uh, mainly like presenting and driving the conversation. The idea is that um, this is like an open discussion so everyone can chime in whenever they want. And if you don't feel comfortable like speaking uh, with the video or whatever, you can always like post your questions in the uh, side chat. And also Shannon has just pasted um, Google Docs uh, document there um, that we're gonna be putting in the wiki. Um, in the apropedia.org uh, slash open climate uh, page that Emilio has um, facilitated for us. And I'm gonna give a little bit of background on how we started with this idea and maybe like do a short round of presentations. Um, but basically um, kind of the story behind this is that uh, last year, we started like asking some questions with Alex Stinson, who is here, um, around what's the connection or intersection between the open and the climate crisis and how the open could help or not solve some of the challenges that we face in the climate crisis. And then fortunately, we came across Shannon and of course, Emilio and I have been friends for a long time uh, in the creative commons space. Um, and so we started like having kind of conversations around how we can explore more this topic. And so um, the idea is that we're gonna have this set of calls for six or seven months. Um, they are kind of an experiment in trying to figure out uh, some of these questions and conversations, and then we'll see where we go from there. So we are not committing to like making them like, s s like uh, moving them forward longer if we don't need to, but we do want to uh, sort of try to see uh, what's out there. Um, that's kind of a little bit of the background. Um, I'm going to present myself and then I'm going to call in the people according to my gallery view um, to go ahead and present themselves if they want to. And if you don't want to, that's entirely fine. And then uh, we're going to uh, hand it over to Emilio, who's going to be talking about Apropedia. So um, hello everyone, my name is um, Evelyn um, Heidel or Heidel, um, our, but people also know me as Can. I've been a long time uh, member of Creative Commons and like a community organizer there at Creative Commons and working with um, Open Glam, uh, galleries, libraries, archives and museums. Although now I'm moving more into other stuff, basically open and climate. Um, and that's, that's uh, basically it. Shannon, do you wanna go ahead? Yes, thanks. Hi, I'm Shannon Dosmegan, and um, I'm a fellow with the Shuttleworth Foundation working on a project called the Open Environmental Data Project. Um, so interested in figuring out ways that we can uh, ensure that data from a community level is usable um, when we are addressing issues around the environment more broadly and climate change more specifically. Emilio. Hi, I'm Emilio Vellis, uh, and I'm uh, executive director of the Apropedia Foundation that manages Apropedia. Great. Uh, yeah, Eric. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm Tiag. Uh, I'm not really uh, a part of the like uh, Commons, uh, Open Commons uh, movement as part of a contributor. I'm very new to this. Uh, uh, together with Tobias, I, uh, I work on the Open Sustain Tech project, a uh, little project we started uh, a few months back. And since then, uh, started a few other projects uh, and trying to yeah, do our part uh, in the climate change uh, fight. And uh, if I'm not working on this, I'm a mechanical engineer by trade. And uh, yeah, I'm just curious to see what happens here today. Great. Alex? Um, hi, I'm Alex Stenson. Um, I'm a senior strategist at the Wikimedia Foundation. My current uh, um, kind of focus is figuring out how the Wikimedia community can organize to uh, participate in, in various spaces. Um, and I'm currently running a campaign with UN Human Rights on the right to a healthy environment. And Wikipedia community is contributing to that, but I also work with our community groups focused on the sustainability and climate. Great, um, Anna? 
Heist. Oh, okay, always have to check whether there are two or more Annas. Um, <laughs> hi, I'm uh, a student at ETH Zurich studying physics currently. Um, I'm also totally new to this. I'm very involved in like climate sustainability work there, but I uh, passed by the MozFest and happened upon um, Richard Litauer, I think, at the uh, Sustainos event, and he invited me to the Discord of Sustainos, and that's then how I, a few days ago, was brought to attention of these events by Tobias. Great, welcome. Uh, Bri Schrantz? Hi, uh, my name is Brianna Johns, although usually I just go by Bree. Um, I just finished my undergraduate degree at North Carolina State University, and right now I am the community coordinator for the Gathering for Open Science Hardware. Um, <clears throat> so I do know Shannon pretty well. But um, yeah, I, while I was an undergraduate student, I did a lot of work with uh, open science, public science, and citizen science. So I definitely have a lot of interest in that angle. Great, thank you. Uh, Peter. Hello, uh, I'm uh, Peter May Rust. I'm also a Shuttleworth Fellow, which is where I heard about this from Shannon. Um, I'm uh, very interested in extracting knowledge from the scientific literature. And about 18 months ago, Simon Worthington at um, uh, the German uh, TIB, and I set up a Force 11 group to extract climate knowledge from the literature, uh, but it got rather trumped by the pandemic. We've turned our uh, immediate priority to the pandemic. Great, that sounds awesome. Um, I, I would love to know more about that project. Uh, Christian. Hi, uh, sorry. Um, I'm a math grad student in California. Um, I just heard about this through Anna. Um, so I just came to listen. Great. Um, Marcela? Hi, good to see you. Uh, uh, I'm a journalist in Buenos Aires, Argentina, and I'm interested in the last seven, eight years in the whole open, free, commons, collaborative movement. And through those uh, different uh, ways, I've met um, Scan and Emilio through Creative Commons, and then Shannon, and finally Brie through the gathering of Open Science Hardware. So I'm very happy to see all these marvelous people together. For for the, and, and Ryan, of course, I've met him also. Um, so I'm very happy to see you all together. And I think that that this idea of uh, taking together open and climate and trying to see what we can do with that. It's brilliant. So let's go. Thanks. Um, thanks. Um, Tobias. Uh, yeah, hi, I am Tobias Augsburger. I um, uh, did, I created this open sustain tech uh, project together with Tiag that is uh, actually mapping every uh, open and free project that is related to the topic of climate change and sustainability. Yeah, I'm working as an aerospace engineer for climate research actually uh, in, in Germany. And uh, yeah, I hope I can make a little bit more connections and find more knowledge here about this topic. Great, Michelle. Everyone, it's really nice to see you all here and to be part of this conversation. Um, yeah, I've worked um, in the open movement for um, the last 10 years or so at Creative Commons and now at the Mozilla Foundation. Um, and I'm really interested in now at like questions around sustainability and the internet, um, and making kind of digital technology more sustainable and dismantling the things that are delaying climate action. So really happy to be here and talking about that with you all. Great, Ryan. Hi. Uh, so yeah, I guess I work in as I'm a biomedical engineer and hardware designer. I've been working in sort of the microfluidics space and open hardware. So I, I'm familiar. I've met a few of these people through Gosh, the Gosh community. But I've also been really interested in climate activism and done a lot of organizing and you know rallies and things with like Friday for the Future and uh, 350 and things. So just trying to find like ways to bring those two things together. And I think. 
seems like this might be a good place to find people who are kind of interested. There's some crossover between those. Excited to be yeah, here. Let, let's hope that uh, that's what happens, right? <laughs> um, um, Rene or Rene, Rene, I'm not sure how to pronounce your name. Good morning. I'm Renee Oyos. Um, thank you for holding this event. I just found out about it um, last night from the Environmental Leadership Program, where I was a fellow in 2000. Um, I'm, I was a candidate for the U.S. House of Representatives in both the 2018 and the 2020 cycle, and I was endorsed by the Sunrise Movement. Um, I, uh, I lost both elections, and uh, I'm a per I'm professionally a water quality and environmental justice specialist, and I'm learning more about um, energy and uh, renewable energy and climate issues. And so I, I hopped on just to hear more about your movement and what y'all are doing. Great, thank you. Okay, and so that's basically it for the rounds of introductions. And now let's go and have like a little bit of a round of presentations. The idea is that the presentations are gonna be short, um, are mainly, uh, for some type of Kickstarter to give us some food for thought. And then we can have a um, bit of a conversation around some of these things. Um, I'm also gonna share with you um, some of the uh, things, bits and pieces that we have been discussing in um, previous calls. And then at the MOSFET session where we are trying to do a map, where we're trying to put together some of the organizations and projects that we know that are uh, working in the intersection of open and climate. So if you want to um, help us uh, filling that map, um, that's more than welcome while you listen to uh, the presentations that Emilio and then uh, uh, Tiar and Tobias are, are going to be making. Um, and what I'm going to ask you uh, before handing over to Emilio is that while you're not talking, uh, please consider um, uh, muting your microphone so we don't have any sort of like background noise or if you have an unexpected uh, <laughs> visitor or a bit a cat, a person or another animal, um, <laughs> it doesn't interrupt the whole conversation. Um, so with that being said, Emilio, the floor is all yours. Thanks a lot. And beforehand, I apologize if I have some internet issues. Uh, but all right. So so yeah, first, first of all, thanks a lot for coming to this call. And I will begin by having a brief um, discussion from the side of Upperpedia and from and also a little bit from my personal experience, because I I I come from a, a a somewhat different background. Uh, I'm an engineer by training. I've worked in international development here in El Salvador where I am based. And um, on the side of some work with technology, which uh, made me get to work uh, as part of our Propedia Foundation now. Um, so yeah, to begin, I, I wanted to, to just pique your interest by thinking about what we, uh, think about when we talk about data and uh, environmental data. And usually it's all around numbers and mechanized uh, variables that are being measured. And uh, also about spatial uh, representations of that information that can be useful for making decisions and um, most likely to a top level to lots of people. Um, and for some others, it, it comes more down to how communities use this information and how they gather this information. And in some, in some cases, not in the most uh, professional standardized way, but rather in terms of what they uh, feel, what are their perceptions of this data. And in, in my uh, personal experience, I've done a little of both at the same time. So for example, this is a workshop that I um, did with a colleague uh, also from El Salvador in Nariño, Colombia, on which we were putting together uh, hardware for uh, disaster response and relief together with community work. And we've done this quite a few times in different parts of the world. Um, on which people can 
define what they want to measure. Um, and I've also had this, the experience of working in areas that have been affected by climate change, by natural disasters in general, and the data and information take different nuances and different approaches because they uh, mean something that have, have to be resolved at the time when it's uh, happening. Right? And decisions have to be made and they're difficult um, about living in a place, about um, moving to different areas after a disaster. So when connecting these two sides of using that data, um, it's very difficult sometimes to connect them. And it has to do with a paradigm of international development and of citizen science in general. Uh, from a, a more uh, general perspective and much different from what uh, many of the people here work on. But first of all, sometimes uh, collaborations are very centralized or unidirectional. There's always experts that come to a community, gather information, they um, facilitate workshops with the community and then they go, they go um, and they take all of this information. Um, these are the people that use this information. And also it, it may happen that in other non-open um, realms, um, much of the collaboration happens between people who are very um, similar in approaches and needs, for example, governmental institutions or scientists of specific areas. And then thirdly, because the knowledge and skills and tools are specialized. And that it comes from the side of, first, usually when we think about environmental data and uh, climate and measuring, we think about specific devices that have to be calibrated to specific in a specific way um, that have to be handled in a specific manner so that they can measure. And all of this know-how is, is very specialized. So it's uh, complicated to bring it down to the community. So, so yeah, so now, now I'm bringing my shameless plug to uh, talk a little bit about Apropedia and about what we do. Um, we are a wiki for sustainability and international development. And um, it's been um, contributed to by many people from around the world, mostly the United States, but there's, uh, there's a wealth of information from different areas. And I wanted to bring um, these three items from uh, Yokai Benkler's uh, article on the goodness of peer production, which, is, which are first the decentralization conception and execution of problems and solutions, the harnessing diverse motivations and separation of government and management for property and contract. So basically everyone does whatever they want and collaborate in, <laughs> in whatever way they want, um, despite having different motivations and coming from different backgrounds. And that's one of the nice things about working on a wiki. Um, and in this specific case, this is a wiki for projects, for how people do things. So um, over the past 15 years, we've uh, reached um, a fairly high number of contributions of pages. And many of these are require lots of hours of work because these are descriptions of projects or processes or um, reporting um, international development uh, technical briefs. So they comprise the start to finish for a project. And some of the projects that we can find on Apropedia have to do with uh, measurements about meshing water in community settings. And many of these are uh, done by students. Lots of uh, undergrad and graduate students do their work in developing um, different technologies, hardware for communities or for um, specific uh, 
clients in a way, which could be members of uh, schools or, or a specific uh, person in the community who has a, a need. And we have from start to finish descriptions, bill of materials, and very rough uh, explanations of how to do or how to create low um, cost uh, devices. And it can come from the, the area of design, from how it can be created to specific projects and how people went together or uh, moved to an area and implemented it with the good and the bad. And there's lots of discussion about what went wrong after a couple of years in the project. And there's a, there's a discussion or updates from members of the community or from the students or from uh, students down the line over the years who say, hey, this project didn't work and uh, never do it again or do it this way. So there's, there's always um, information about how these problems are being tackled. And the reason why I'm describing this is because other than the projects, there, when we think about using information about the environment for research, we're thinking about real world situations that come and are uh, about information that's being back mechanized, turned into numbers and then analyzed. And th there has to be in the whole process a, a way to, um, to establish some ways of doing it right. Um, this is, these are some examples of uh, the research that's been done on Apropedia and published as preprints. And, and many of them ha most recently have had to do with uh, solar energy because uh, of the work of Joshua Pierce and his lab, MOST. So there's lots of, uh, lots of information about um, photovoltaics and solar energy in general. And when we come and think about how this research is being done, we can start thinking about the different um, degrees of abstraction that this information takes. Uh, we can think about the data that's being presented at the end, but also the devices uh, as another layer, which is, well calibrated or can be standardized from a list of vendors or can be bought from a uh, person who's producing them. But there's always the, the issue of the open world about how a device was set up in a specific place, um, how, for how long, what were the, the open world um, situations that can lead to errors uh, that do, don't have to do with technology. So there's, when we think about using hardware and measuring anything, especially, but especially the environment, we have to think about how we can uh, transfer this information or these skills for people to interact with that information with those devices. So how can we connect the real world scenarios? And this is where I, I start uh, closing down, but I, I want to explain a little bit about some of the things that on the side of Operpedia we're doing, but there can be many more. And that is one of the reasons why we um, are working on these calls because we want to hear more about how to connect those real world scenarios and the real world needs with uh, the work that we're all doing. So one of them has to do with uh, standardizing the way that hardware is built. And we're using uh, different standards and we're uh, developing them more. This is a, a standard called Open Know How that was developed by uh, a, a group of people um, uh, from different parts of the world who are working on um, scientific open hardware and other areas. And these are um, a set of metadata that we're trying to put together so that anyone can reproduce the hardware that's being built. So on the side of reproducibility, uh, making sure that scientific hardware made even by different labs around the world is uh, to a degree difficult 
but then thinking about serving it to a community or having people to create uh, things themselves also needs a degree of standardization. And all of this can lead to um, these projects being open to be searched and uh, discoverable. So th th that is one of the good things about having well, uh, well set data and well organized information for all these devices and projects. Then we're trying to guide some of the documentation procedures. And this is a, a process that we're undergoing right now, which is to create standards on which, or guides to explain people what are the best ways to, um, to document hardware or the projects. In, in a way, we document um, how to do something, how to create something, but also how to perform a project that involved more areas of community or involvement with uh, real world situations. And all of these have to be documented in a certain way. And it, thinking about environmental data, it, that's something that has you know, been on my mind for a while from some of the work of Shannon, I, 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 which that I've admired much. I, I've seen the work that Public Lab has done in documenting, for example, field notes and very specific information about how uh, measurements were taken. So we, in a, in a way, we've taken some of that and uh, tried to emulate it so that our community can document in, a, uh, in an easy fashion uh, and that they can transfer that information to others. And most recently, we've started working on a template for uh, annotated video that is useful for people who want to give out information in a way that's structured uh, because video can make it a little difficult, uh, but we're trying to bring it to the wiki level and bring that information to people in different settings. So this, for example, is for water audit spreadsheets. So how to measure water. So yeah, we have different technical approaches and, um, and we're looking forward to learning more and getting into this uh, whole, yeah, this whole community that's trying to uh, work on very specific measurements of, of climate change. And, and yeah, so that's, that's it for me, thanks. Thank you, and thanks for like perfect timing. <laughs> um, also, if you want to share the uh, slides and give everyone the link so they can actually browse them through, because I think that there are some questions that probably are going to be open um, after, like on your last uh, slides. Um, I'm so like whatever question you have, like write them down because I'm going to transition to Tobias and Tiar now. So they can talk a little bit about their project uh, called Proton Types. Um, and so I don't know who of you wants to go first and start, um, but uh, the floor is all yours. Okay, Chuck. Uh, I have some slides. <laughs> um, so, Jack, do you want to say something or do you want to just get into the topics that I'm talking? I mean, just just go ahead. Uh, I will fill everything in else later. Okay. Yeah. Also, nice to see Peter Murray Rust uh, here in this call. Uh, he he helped us a little bit with some uh, let's say problems uh, that we have with the Open Sustain Tech project. But okay, I will share my screen and then uh, you have something to look that looks better than I do. Uh, some nice slides, completely done with open source tooling, for sure. Um, so uh, it's actually a talk that I give at the LF Energy Foundation in some weeks, but so it, there could be some things that are not perfect. So please tell me if you see something that's really bad. Um, so actually, uh, I, I have some long time experience with open source because I worked for DHL in some research institute and we automated trucks for the yard uh, 
logistics. So we built a robotic a robots and in uh, in robotics, there's a lot of open source going on and there's a very huge community and uh, we built a complete uh, software stack for autonomous driving based on open source tools and we had a lot of collaboration and cooperation with different institutes and all this stuff was very, um, yeah, let's say open uh, from the mindset. You maybe also know about artificial intelligence frameworks and all this stuff is very open from the uh, knowledge that is uh, there. And uh, I switched my job um, and I was curious to more to this climate uh, institute I'm working at the moment as an engineer. And I was curious if uh, in, in uh, open in sustainable technology, the same mindset can be found. And actually it is much smaller and the, the community was much, let's say, uh, more splitted in very different parts and the collaboration was not, was not, not so happy. But what I learned is that uh, it is actually the best way to share and to transport knowledge worldwide. And that's why we created this small, we call it Accelerate, you can call it the community. We are accelerating the idea of free and sustainable technologies. We do it with startups. We help them uh, with different kinds of things, business models and finding the right technology and mindset for um, going open with the right technology and the right part of what they're doing. So from my point of view, open uh, source and um, this uh, open movement is something that actually involved in uh, uh, science. It's actually how was science was like 100 years ago and the years before that, that people just published things and then somebody else built on top of this publication and then they built on top of this publication. Uh, unfortunately, today, science is not like this anymore in every part of the world. But in the past, it was more the mindset of building on the sh shoulders of giants. That's uh, like this, this idea. And what we uh, have, we have this um, two sustainable, it's open uh, slogan uh, a little bit because I learned from my personal uh, experience and also now in the time with proton types that there's a lot of like a lot of marketing going around with sustainability and actually there's not so much action um, like people try to really <laughs> try to do things in a sustainable way but it's more a marketing thing because it's more or less a hype at the moment Unfortunately, it's a hype, uh, I think. And the good thing about openness is you can measure sustainability if you do your things openly. And that's why we say it's true sustainability is open because I don't believe any sustainability if there's no openness because there's so much lying and stuff going around with some labels. You put it on your product and then you think it's sustainable. But if there's no proof and no data that this is actually sustainable, I don't trust you. <laughs> it's for me, uh, I'm at the point where uh, things that are not open, I actually a lot of times think that they're not sustainable. Um, and I also think because of collaboration, um, like in terms of climate change, you need to actually spread knowledge worldwide to, um, to, to have an impact. Like here in Germany, they're thinking about a lot of about, actually at my institute, they're creating patents on renewable energy things and then I say that's useless. You can say it's not sustainable because when you create a pattern on something that is uh, being needed worldwide to have actually a sustainable impact, you can just stop what you're doing. Um, and to what I also have seen, and this was a little bit, um, let's say not so, uh, not so nice to see that there was no mapping going around about what is actually sustainable projects worldwide. Um, and that's why we started this bottom-up approach um, to map the complete open and sustainable world um, on the Open Sustain Tech website. 
uh, we did it by a completely manual approach. So every uh, project is handpicked and then we check the quality of the documentation of the code. We checked a little bit if this is an active project, if there are, have an open mindset or some, some openness and um, then we put them on the website to, to support this idea. Uh, and yeah, this is a little bit the, the ideas that we also uh, want to, to, to bring into companies and organizations that we uh, are consulting. Um, also open business models to help them how to actually build something maybe like an you can imagine a professional photovoltaic uh, system and how can you actually make a business out of creating such a thing. For most of the people, it seems um, uh, very, I don't, not, it's not something that is economically being possible, but there is no proof and actually there is also no open hardware like the Risk Five Corporation that is, um, uh, open and at the same time people are making money based on that and it's possible and we want to show people how to do it. Um, what we also do is we find like hidden gems in this vast, uh, yeah, let's say open world uh, like ray tracing, modeling in photovoltaic or a lot of stuff that you can imagine um, related to uh, sustainable technology in general. and. Um, I said that I was working in robotics and in robotics, it was very common to, that you follow the so-called Unix philosophy. Uh, if you don't know what the Unix philosophy is, it's something that is very uh, important for what is actually made open source so successful. And um, it is that you are able um, to combine different uh, open source projects to create something completely new um, and every, it's, that's the modular approach you can imagine out of this. And uh, at the beginning of the open source community, there was everybody had a small package, a small thing, and you, they put this together and built something new. And one, what we try to do now in the next month is to put things from the open sustain tech website together and to build something that is actually compensating the energy consumption of your servers. And we are planting trees in an automated way based on that. Uh, we have this continuous reforestation uh, project already finished. And what we want to do is we want to measure uh, with different open source tools, uh, the power consumption of your servers, the carbon intensity of your location. Then we want to identify where to put the trees with the most impact on the carbon cycle. And here's also a green cost explorer that gives us a little bit, it's a little bit like this electricity map to see where uh, is the electricity green and where it is not and what is the percentage actually. And that's what we want to do together with another company. Uh, um, one thing that's not so nice, this part is not open source because this reforestation as a service API that we are using that is from another company. But we want to show uh, with this part, how to accelerate and how to build or based on open source. And we have some other projects, ideas that we want to go into something like an open sustain academy to help people build to use this project. And yeah, that's more or less it. Um, one thing that could be maybe also interesting for Peter because uh, the, the relation to Peter was we, we try to automate, uh, uh, let's see, I found my window again. We try to automate the, um, um, the, the finding of the sustainable projects, maybe based on keywords in combination with papers, in combination with other stuff to, to, to sustain our project. Because what you can imagine is, uh, we have here the Open Sustain Tech uh, website, and uh, that's actually not the website, it's just the project, but let me see. Yeah, it's actually the website. And the thing is, we want to sustain it in itself uh, so that people put new projects on the list and, or that we 
find pr new projects in an automated way so that it's a sustainable. But we actually were not able to build something like that until now. Um, what we try to do now is we are planting 100 trees in an automated way when somebody is adding a new project to the list. That's actually what we are doing now. And it really helped us because since we're doing that, I think we got much more uh, pull requests. We got like in two weeks, uh, seven pull requests. Um, and so we planted 700 trees now uh, with the help actually of this automation of tree planting. Yes. And maybe one last word, uh, what we also wanted to do, and that's maybe the most interesting thing is um, we want to read out the open sustain tech uh, database. It's the readme. Um, so that's the markdown file where it's an awesome list um, uh, file type, or not file type, um, list type. And we want to read it in an automated way. And then we want to, uh, to, to gather metadata from the GitHub and from GitLab to automatically uh, calculate some metadata of the project to check the health of the project, to check if a project is still active, um, to check um, what is the number of um, uh, issues they have, if they need support and all this stuff, so that you have a much more and easier way to actually browse the database and to also get some more information of every project. That's what we plan to do in the future. So there's actually two larger projects that we want to uh, do and that's the uh, continuous reforestation that is actually measuring your power consumption and is planting trees based on that. And the other stuff that we want to do is we want to map the sustainable technology world very in detail <laughs> to give really also to see how it is growing and where you can maybe participate. And um, essentially, that's also important thing to see where projects are missing and also how projects are maybe related. So if they are depending on each other or if everybody is um, reinventing his own wheel, <laughs> what is not sustainable actually. <laughs> okay. uh, so <laughs> Jack, you had no, no uh, some words from you maybe. Yeah, I think there is not much to add from me. Um, I only thing I could reiterate maybe is this idea about not reinventing the wheel. I think that resonated with me very much what Emilio said earlier, um, that there are a lot of issues with people doing projects and they're not working out and there is no standardization and uh, they do new stuff that is not actually new and they didn't just didn't know about it, didn't know where to look. And uh, since we noticed this um, yeah, as a big problem, I think this is where we started with our work. Okay, what's your feedback? <laughs> Open class. Oh, well, I, I think this is great. <laughs> I don't know if others <laughs> like uh, <laughs> shared that idea with me. Um, also, it feels a little bit weird like seeing myself in the screen there. Perfect, thank you, Tobias. Um, I, I mean, I think it's, it's great. Um, and um, yeah, so I don't know if uh, anyone like, I know that there were a couple of questions there on the side chat. So we have around 15 minutes for discussion. So if anyone wants to like actually bring some of those questions to you, I know that some people were um, actually asking um, what file format is the one that you are using for that uh, um, um, sort of um, map that you were showing. Um, someone missed the name. Um, yeah, and if folks wanna go ahead and ask questions. Yeah, I jump straight in. Uh, just, I guess you kind of touch upon it, but more precisely, maybe, do you really have a target audience in mind? Um, it's everybody who is developing software in this domain. Uh, if you want to build something sustainable, uh, look into this. It's the, the audience is very broad. I don't think there's this. 
I think most uh, of the people, when you really want to understand what these projects are doing, you have to need a deeper insight. It's really more technical. It's engineers and it's software developers that are really, let's say, in the product development that are really need to develop something in this domain and that maybe look into the list and see that somebody else did the same thing and they maybe could co collaborate, cooperate, maybe use the project and not reinvent the wheel, or maybe just get in contact with them and ask them what they experienced when making that. <laughs> it's, um, it, but it's really more technical in software developers. Um, and the education cannot... section is also directed towards that audience. Yes, it's, if I understand it in the right way, the education is also more about software, right? The rest, actually, the business section, we did the business section and the other sections, especially the business section, because we've seen nobody else did it. Like, it was also a strange thing that I've seen that there is a lot of funding going around in this domain, but nobody listed it. And it sometimes really helps to, to, to go through a list and to see if you know about all the projects. But you are right, the business section is more than not for software developers. It's about more like people that are starting a project and need funding, whatever it is. It could be also a hardware project um, that, or it could be that there's, it is somebody who is uh, in the, the uh, is not an engineer, maybe is a business developer. Um, maybe to give you a different insight uh, onto your question, um, this is a problem we struggle with, and the education and the business section are uh, our yeah. We we try to offer the yeah, the insights that we have to more people because we do this thing on GitHub. By default, we only get the GitHub people, and uh, this is an issue. And we only do software, so it's difficult to reach people who don't do software and who are um, intimidated by doing software stuff. And uh, this is, uh, I think, a long-term goal of us to try to invite more people who are not engineers or not technical to maybe try their, uh, their luck in doing something with software. It's not very difficult to learn uh, or to do something, a little project, but they uh, need to be invited and have the feeling that they are welcome and they cannot do anything wrong. Um, yeah, this is... a. Uh, uh, like a, it's a long-term goal to try to reach more people who are not having this academic background. Yeah. Maybe so, I, oh, sorry. So <laughs> there's a few the hands. Evelyn, impressed me with this project was um, that you managed to analyze uh, the popularity and the health of projects on uh, GitHub, and that seems to me far more valuable than analyzing, you know, citations in research papers and things of that sort. Um, and that there's a real chance that this would give some ideas to how these were interlinked and which ones used uh, resources from which others. Yeah, I hope that we can improve that by this automation that we will do. But, it, but that's also the reason every, every project in the list is now actually a Git repository. That's why we really focus on Git repositories. So if the project has not a Git repository, we actually skip it, it's not open. You can say whatever you want, call it open. If I don't find a Git repository, it's not open. And the benefit is actually we can automate now uh, to gather metadata for every project because the GitHub API allows us. The problem is I don't want to focus only on GitHub because I don't want, would like to focus also on GitLab and maybe it's something else and this is not really, yeah. That's an unsolved problem, but we can we can do it for the GitHub projects, and then maybe provide also you more insight about what tool is actually very important and used by every project. Um, Michelle, you have your hand raised up. Yeah, I was just reflecting on maybe like a an, an interesting tension between uh, Apropedia and uh, and the open sustainable technology work that has been shared because I think there's this um, 
kind of what counts as a what counts as a technology and which ways are we validating certain modes of technology, which I think, I mean, I, I work and <laughs> admire software and thinking like, you know, things that work in, in GitLab and also like, there's a lot that we can be doing at a, at a software level, but I think maybe a, like a, a friendly critical reflection would be how could we expand or complement different modes of achieving change and building technology. Um, and anyway, there was just a, even just seeing these two projects side by side um, was, that seemed like a lot of opportunity to explore. Um, and I think one of the challenges, at least I find in working with um, kind of technology first approaches is that um, the climate crisis is not a technology crisis. It's a people and planet and living organism crisis. And so how do we have appropriate hierarchies with our technology so that it's in service of, of life um, rather than our life being in service of the tech? And that's something I find um, tricky and even in our uh, solutions approaches, we have to kind of account for that. So anyway, that was my kind of a reflection seeing these approaches, I, which I love, I, yeah. Anyway, I really like the, the leadership and thinking that, that has been shared. But, but you should think in it in another way. You can think about open sustain tech that you need to open up the sustainable sustainability of technology. So it's not actually technology that you need, but you need to open up what actually is sustainable technology and what not. Totally. So That's, it's yeah. really about the mindset. And it's also what I think it's more important to have the culture change. And but actually with digitalization, with yeah, let's say with data and models, you can prove what is sustainable. And that's actually something that you need technology because it's very complex to actually measure and to say, I don't know elect, uh, if, if nuclear power is sustainable or if bioenergy is sustainable or if batteries or if hydrogen is sustainable. <laughs> the answer is, I don't know, but you can only, I think, find the right answer if you open up the discussion yeah yeah well yeah, and I, I, oops, go ahead Emilio because I was <laughs> gonna say like your, your project is all about community so go ahead yeah go quickly yeah I choose to, I, I think that one of the things that I've seen uh, working in open hardware on in all projects is that people don't know how to document them and don't know what to put in them right so um, I think it's well, the nice thing about having the, these discussions about re redefining what open technology, environmental technology is, is that we're also learning how to tell a story about technology. And that's super important. And one of, one of the things that we were discussing on while working on metadata standards is, you know, the, the need for descriptive metadata that's not really about a number, about a date, but rather describing why did you create it and why is it used for? And, you know, someone can create um, a very nice uh, monitoring device, but they don't see it as an environment. Like they just created it for something different and then you repurpose it. So, you know, having these uh, socially or more person oriented approaches is also important and teaching people how to tell those stories so that other people can take a project and say hey I repurposed this into yeah. using it for climate change that's super useful um Max has this hand up hi Max yes hi thanks um Great project. It's real. I'm so glad that I managed to join this, even though I jumped in um, a bit late. And it's great to see some familiar faces um, and talk about these issues. And I just, I'm really just sort of um, following on from some of the comments I put in. Where, I mean, I totally agree with um, sort of th there is this sort of problem of discoverability with um, open in general, open source uh, software, hardware, open education resources, etc. Um, and I think any any all of these efforts, and I've been in, I've been sort of working on different similar efforts, maybe focused much more sort of on the education side. Um, and I think, and I uh, what Tobias was saying uh, about patents and sort of the the um, you know the the amount of the, the fact if you know once you put once you put an enclosure around something, then it, it, it's you're really um, uh, yeah, you, you're really damaging its potential use, especially when it comes to something like climate change. Um, and um, 
and it's in, in that sense also of just sort of wondering about sort of using systems that are already in place that I bring up these sort of couple of questions, which is one of them is the Open Innovation Network. Uh, I mean, I know of the Open Innovation Network, but I've never interacted with them. So because I'm not a hardware person, I, you know, I'm not, I've never been involved in, in patents, in, in patents. So I don't know if anybody else is familiar with them. Do you know if do you have any sort of any opinion on them either way in terms of whether they could be some a useful model to push our institutions if we're working for educational institutions, for example, to really push our institutions to use uh, patent pools like the Open Innovation Network. Um, and also, I just wanted to highlight this, um, the Software Sustainability Institute, because I think they, they're doing a lot of things that um, the projects that, I've, that you've been talking about here are looking at doing in terms of making sure that contributions to software um, have the same level of recognition as other contributions, especially when it comes to, to research. Um, so again, sort of, you know, reusing some of the work or some of the standards that they're working on and introducing them to this community. That's really, that was my main um, contribution. Great, I see that someone, um, oh, Max ha had his hand up, sorry, I, that was from before. Um, anyone else would like to like make a comment or a question or something to share? Okay, uh, if no one, yeah, go ahead. Uh, uh, I was just gonna say, I, I can kind of mirror uh, what I said in the comment. Um, I, I think it's interesting that both these projects highlighted like the need for storytelling uh, about and like documentation and like connecting the, the, the issues together. Um, like people are doing things, we need to document them. We need the right metadata, we need the right story. Um, this is, I think, you know, part of our, like, Scan, you and I, our early thesis on starting these uh, conversations was, like, there is a story that's missing uh, here. And so I think that's, like, this is such a great way to start because it, it draws that connection. It's like, oh, there is a storytelling gap between the open movement and environmental movement on technology. And, like, hopefully we can use these, like, future calls to do something similar. Um, so I, I just wanted to, like, on other open tactics. Um, so I, I wanted to highlight that because I, I think this is like, it's a great start to the conversation. Great. Um, okay, so we are now at the end of the hour and I don't want to take any more time from um, Emilio, uh, Tiar, Tobias and the rest of people that it's in the room. Um, so I'm going to thank you, of course, Emilio and Tiar and Tobias for giving us these presentations and food for thought. And to Shannon, who has been in the background, like furiously typing, taking a lot of notes. <laughs> She's like um, the best note taker ever that you could have. And um, for those of you who want to join, uh, well, of course, you can leave your email there in the notes talk if you want to be notified about the next poll. And then if not, uh, watch the appropriate.org slash open um, um uh, page and that's where you're going to get notified and the next call is going to be facilitated by Emilio and so I'm also looking forward to that um, and so thanks everyone for joining see you there bye, bye. thank you for sharing bye, -bye.